do. Awesome. So here we are, just finished sprint 30. Um, starting 31 today. Um, usual agenda, uh, hold questions for the end. Feel free to post them in the chat as you please. Um, there is a link to the mural board as well. You could dump your questions right on there. But if you prefer to hang um, people or anything like that, we'll make sure it gets to the right spot. Uh, awesome. So Sprint 30, some accomplished goals from our team. Um, we've been working on some ways about ending applications, which ties into the scholastic standing piece, which we will be demoing today. Uh, tuition remittance, um, some UI work for that. Um, on the ministry side, some work to do with restrictions, the unsuccessful weeks rules and the stop disbursement rules. Um, that stop disbursement rules is particularly the stop BCSL um, restriction. Uh, approve and denying student exceptions. That's something we haven't talked about in a while, which will be part of the demo as well. Um, generate disbursement report. That's another report similar to what we showed last week, just different data. Um, the other side of the glass standing UI piece. Um, Processing the disbursement file, which that one we won't be demoing today, but that's basically the receipt file or the disbursement file we get back from our federal partners about what money the student actually received. Um, the student side for exceptions, and then some QA and design stuff, very similar to the last couple of sprints, just continuing that same thing. Um, sorry, I do have a bit of a cough today, so apologies for that in advance. Um, some business context here. So I'm sure most people have seen the email here, but we do have Kayla joining us here that I think Carlo or Chad, if you are around, I want to give a brief introduction. I certainly can. I don't know if Marlo's on there, but um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andrew, and, and welcome to, to Kayla. And I think um, many of you probably did see a message introducing her um, to the project, so we're we're very happy to to have her join the team. Kaylin's got um, a lot of experience leading uh, large transformation projects um, and has worked um, with the citizen services and the um, supporting the digital investment board and the digital investment office. So um, has a lot of context with ad, agile um, development as well. And I think what's great too is she's also spent some time um, on the institutional side and uh, worked uh, at UVic and I can, let her fill in the details about that that role, but um, you know, uh, has has a good understanding of the financial aid office and and some of the supports um, needed to uh, uh, support the institutional side. So, yeah, we're really happy to to have her here, um, and she is on the call today. So I'll I'll let her say something at this point. Thanks, Chad. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be working on this project. As Chad mentioned, my original background is from the institution side and uh, while I was there I worked on IT projects for the student awards and financial aid with office within UVic so it feels a little bit like coming full circle uh, coming into advanced ed to to work on this project so I am very excited to get started I will have a a quick start and then a, a long absence I'm, I'm heading on vacation but I'm uh, will be back in July and ready to dive in a little deeper on things and, and get going. So thank you all for having me. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, Marlo, I think I saw you on the call. Was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I am on the call. Thanks so much, Andrew. We were, I was going incognito for a couple minutes there, but <laughs> now I just wanted to say welcome um, and thank you, Kaylin, for joining us. And I'm, I am really excited that, uh, that we're gonna have uh, some really solid bench strength in, in the senior project director role. So that I won't even don't even need to say anything more. I think Chad and uh, Kaylin have covered it all, but uh, but but a big welcome from me. Awesome. Well, thanks for all that. I'm gonna pass it over to Elise now. Great. 
Thanks, Andrew. So some of us just got out of a branch meeting, so some of this might be a little bit of review for you, but of course we have lots of other folks joining us today. So just wanted to make sure that folks were up to speed on a recent decision as it relates to SIN. So um, up until this decision point, we were all under the excited impression that we were going to verify SIN or validate SIN with CRA and that that would allow us to reduce our time frame to about an hour and a half um, at account setup. Unfortunately, we've run into some issues with that approach and have had to shift back to the current validation process, uh, which does happen with uh, ESDC at the central um, federal level, um, and that we will be validating our SIN with that, and that could mean um, a delay of about a day in most circumstances. There'll be some exceptional circumstances that it could take a few days. Um, the good news, however, is that that still will occur at account set up, not at every application. So we have been able to, to make a real improvement for students there. And that decision uh, was made by Chad and Marlowe after much discussion and of course consultation with the feds. And it's also allowed uh, the project to move forward. It was kind of blocking a couple of other things. So, so that decision being made has allowed some other progress in other areas as it relates to overriding the SIN as need be on occasion, um, as well as updating SIN um, kind of when SINs expire, because there are some SINs that do expire. So just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. And uh, you'll see some stuff coming up in the next few sprints um, around SIN. Um, also, just let you know, we do have a few uh, um, engagement sessions scheduled over the next uh, couple of weeks, but we continue to engage with different folks. Um, and those are more external stakeholders, but we are continuing to meet with our different feature owners and with the business. So most recently we, we had a really interesting conversation about what folks inside the project call exceptions, what we generally refer to as those upfront appeals. So I believe today we're going to see uh, some of the outcome of that, which is super exciting. And of course, with that SIN validation discussion, we'll be seeing in the next few sprints some more um, ways in which SIN will be managed uh, by us to help the business uh, do what they need to do to get students on track to get their applications done. We're continuing to clarify the MVP. We went over the MVP in a business check in for for some of you that are outside of our branch. We did do a bit of an internal review and uh, that the numbers are getting down, right? We're getting down to about I think there's about 15 lines. It's not that simple. Um, there's lots of work still to be done um, and those last kind of 15 or so items are there some biggies on there? So for example, BC service card alternative, BC EID alternative, but, uh, but we're really getting into that, um, that space of some of those biggies. And of course, as the business, we're doing whatever we can to get those acceptance criteria to, uh, to Andrew and the dev team. Um, I just want to remind folks that we have that that big spreadsheet that Arena showed us back in March um, that is the MVP list. And of course, I'm referring to the fact that 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 list that hasn't been closed is getting smaller and smaller. But there is some circumstances where things are coming off or going on to that list. And I just want to clarify that process. Um, through change requests, very formal written documents that go up through Chad and Marlowe for approval. Um, on occasion, we will add scope to that MVP list. And most recently, we've completed two change requests. The first change request added a request for unfunded weeks 
This is coming directly out of the EPI project and a review that we did um, working with that team to identify that as a critical piece of functionality that was needed for MVP. The second piece, slightly smaller, but just as critical, um, was somehow we, we weren't showing the part-time courses on the PIR, which made it difficult for the institutions to provide information. And so that critical piece was added into scope. And then lastly, what's currently been requested from Marlo and Chad, and this is a bit more of an administrative one, but through through the change to SIP codes and moving away from SABC program codes, as we were testing, uh, we found a, a, a gap. And so we needed to come up with a way to ensure that um, the files can be integrated with the feds and make sure, of course, that disbursement happens. So we've identified a change needed around the federal field of study codes. So if you're wanting to see what those change requests look like, um, they are posted in our feature owner area, um, which is more of an internal group, um, but certainly we can get you access to that. Uh, there's only one change request process posted there, but the second one will be up as soon as it's formally approved um, and moved in there. So that's how items get added to the MVP list. Um, it, it's on an exceptional basis and it's through a really rigorous process. Chad, did you want to have a comment there before I talk about how things come off the list? I think you kind of just just hit on it with your last comment there, mm -hmm. Elise, but just just wanted to reiterate like how important it is for us to keep scope manageable and what we've committed to over the last few few months. And um, you know, if it, if it wasn't clear, I just wanted to kind of add that it's it's we're not looking for things or 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 things that could be sort of improvements or or things that we would like to have like that will that will all come later and there will be a process for that but um mm -hmm. you know we are um although we had a delay this year like we are still very worried about timelines and and so as Elise just mentioned it is it needs to be a rigorous process and so um you know part of the assessment is to ensure that it's absolutely critical um for the first release um that it you know enforces policy that there's no workaround um in place and so you know like Ali said we have had a few and we hope that um we're able to keep it to a, a a real minimum of things on on the other side um you know we do have a process for removing things as well yep. um and so you know that's 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 a possibility in some cases where where we can manage without certain functionality. So I, I would just like to keep that on the table as well. And and you know there may there may come a point once we've estimated everything that we really have to to revisit that. So I think you you mentioned it at least and just just wanted to reinforce kind of the the rigor that we need to have around this or I don't think we're ever going to be able to get this product out the door if we keep adding things. So thanks yeah. Elise. Yep. Yeah, thanks. And and certainly that's been a discussion and I think folks are doing um really well in in getting to 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 kind of I don't want to use the word accepting but acknowledging that difference between a must have and a may have. And so we are also tracking all of those great enhancement ideas and all of those things that we want to have in the system. Um and so we have a an enhancement list and the feature owners are looking at uh, a process to prioritize that list. Um, that's something that, that we'll be looking at in the next couple months to be bringing that forward as well. So that when we have an opportunity to identify additional features after that MVP is developed, that, that we know what our first number one is. So, so we're working on that. Um, so that's the process to get items onto the MVP list. It must go through a change request. We write it up. We present it to Chad and Marlowe. There's an approval. So those are the critical items. There are some items that have come off of the MVP list, um, and they come off of the MVP list through a similar analysis process. And so with each of the different feature owners and the different teams, for example, we've gone through that list and really cut out any of the pieces that we realized were not necessary. Just to give you an idea, there was five. 
there was there was only five that have come off of that list after consultation with the business and we were able to identify the fact that they were not needed. I don't expect at this point that there's certainly not an active plan to be cutting anything else. Um, so we're we're in a place now where we're really focused on that last group of items to make sure we get our acceptance criteria through to Andrew and the dev team so that they can evaluate and determine what would it take? What's the solution to build? And of course, how much work is that? So that's what's happening there. Um, and then lastly, just so folks know, we do have our new change analyst starting next week. Uh, her name is Becky, and um, she's going to be starting to develop some of that training material, reviewing that training plan, uh, starting to work with different institutions around the EPI support material, which is one of the biggest areas of change, um, but really starting to kick that off. So that'll be super exciting when uh, when she joins next week. So that's what's going on in the business side of things, and um, I'll address any questions and comments at the end when we get to questions. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, moving on to some demo stuff. Uh, I'm going to try and do the best here. Some of these are a bit larger to do every single case um, through them, but going to do our best here. So the first one we're actually going to look at is exceptions. So as a reminder, sorry, that too. So exceptions are basically the upfront um, areas of the application where a student says something that may make them eligible, ineligible for funding, something like that, or change things and basically we need to be able to tell the application to keep going forward or not. Um, this here is an example of a question that has an exception attached to it. So if they select Canadian citizen, obviously this whole box here from this does not show up and you just continue on your application. If you select one of the others, you have to do this um, this area here and there's instructions and you basically have to upload a document. Um, this is one I think offhand there is nine, ten ish. I think that there's ten. Um, but basically what we've done is there's a dynamic way in the application that if you answer a question in a certain way, that basically flags an exception. So we're going to take a look at this one. In this case, the student filled out the application and hit submit. This is the only question that they answered this way. Um, so this application is sitting in progress waiting for an exception to be granted to either push the application forward or not. So this is 92 here and I'm going to log in as a. Sorry, I have too many tabs open. Uh, ministry user, which is. Holy black bar. Right here. So just so happened that we're already on application 92. But if I wasn't, I'm just going to go. I think I can do 92. And this is Emily's here. And I'm just going to look at 92, this application. So we can see here that there's a student exception waiting for this application. There is another view to come to basically compile all of the ones sitting and pending in a nice sort of queue, you could say, about because it's not practical to go into every single student every single day and check all their applications. That makes no sense. So there'll be a view to basically navigate you here and then you can address it however you need to. Um, so in here you can view the request. At this point, this form is quite flexible, but you can see that there is one exception for uh, citizenship for protected persons, which if we look at their application here uh, on the personal information, you can see it. You can download the document do whatever you need to do um, as well through here, depending on if you need more information or et cetera, you can always go back to the student account, look at their file uploads and do whatever you need to do basically. But on here, if we go and approve the, approve the application, it will go down here and then um, it's in progress right now, but this is the original assessment and then it will move to the next stage. I can't remember exactly all the criteria here, so it might be waiting for credit or not. Sorry, uh, 
income verification. But if all goes well, it should be back to the student here. Okay, well, this application, I won't go into the back end to see exactly the, the criteria for everything, but basically the application moves forward to that next part. Um, this application might be waiting for a PIR, for example, and then it has to go through and the institution does the PIR or gather parent information or something like that. But that's basically the criteria for that. If the student, or sorry, if the ministry clicks decline on that area, so if they go in here and if they hit decline, basically the application doesn't keep moving forward. There are some enhancements to come about making how do we let the student know what, like we said no, why we say no, what happened, and there is that area there to make sure that it's known to the student what is happening. But so if the student, when they filled out their application, if they picked, I believe the other one is estranged from parents or travel costs, I believe is another one. Um, you could see two, two requests here, three, four, five, Hopefully they don't pick all 10 exceptions, but the system's flexible enough that if there's 10, you'll see 10. And you'll be able to see on the application however that works um, or however they answered their questions. Just gonna check what we got to do, do, do. So that's the exception piece right there. Again, I'm not gonna go through 10 applications for each exception and multiples or not or declined. But basically, if there's more than one exception, you'll see that there was more than one exception here. And then obviously this is able to be updated, scaled, whatever we need to do to make this better for each of the users. We're going to next look at The tuition remittance in the UI portion here. So I'm going to go to what do I have? 93, an application here that is waiting for enrollment. So this is they've already gotten an assessment. It's, um, it's sitting there waiting to be confirmed for enrollment. Um, for each enrollment, this works the exact same way. Obviously, this is not the same process for like the bulk COE, et cetera, et cetera. This is just in the UI front. During um, confirmation of enrollment, you'll get a little window. Do you want to request it or not? If you do, you have to enter a dollar amount. And if you don't, it just continues through. Um, this value here is the is validated based off, I believe it, it's the lesser of the actual tuition plus the mandatory fees, I believe it is. Could be program related costs, I'll have to dig that up. Um, but it's either this plus this or the lesser of the total um, remittable money that they're getting. So if they're getting BK, BCSL, and CSL, et cetera, and only certain ones are remittable, basically based off the stacking order, that's your maximum that you can remit. So, Ideally, if we tried to request five million ish dollars invalid tuition remittance amount. If you enter hundred dollars, it's confirmed. And now a hundred dollars is now remittable. And that's Andrew, can I yeah. just confirm? So these are the changes that came out of the tuition remittance project that Robin was leading before her departure. And so this is how we are making adjustments to what we had originally. Correct. There was also a question there from Wade. Uh, we'll you, save sure. the questions for the end there. Uh, okay. But um, just going to go on to the next piece here, just because I want to make sure we can get through everything. Uh, report change. So going to look at 
actually we'll look at the scholastic standing here since I'm already in the institution. So as an institution, we do have some little tweaks and things to make here because this was just wrapped up. So again, like over the next even day, it'll be updated again. But we've changed the reported change view to look quite similar to the confirmation enrollment view. So you can actually tell which applications you can report a change on and which ones you can't report a change on. Whereas before every application was in there and would always stay in there. So there's a deviation between when an application is eligible to be reported a change on. It will show up in your first area, very similar to confirmation enrollment. If you're able to do it, it's in the first tab. If you're not able to do it either, because you have already done it or because you um, it's past the time that shows up over here. So you'll see here that there's one that's unavailable either because it was done already reported to withdraw on or um, because it's past the X days um, that I believe right now is 43 days if I'm not mistaken. Um, but so that this front page here again, just ignore some of the data here. This is in our dev environment, so the data is not the best. But so this application here, once you report a change on it, it will basically move to that second area because you can't report a withdrawn application twice. Um, on this, this does lead into these areas very closely. So the restrictions for applications. Um, particularly the withdraw restriction and the unsuccessful weeks. So look at the unsuccessful weeks first, basically during um, the instance where a student does not complete the program, we collect the number of unsuccessful weeks. Basically what we do is we keep a counter and then as soon as uh, a application is reported to change on and it hits 68 weeks or more, we will add the scholastic standing restriction. Um, so if you have one application that you were unsuccessful for two weeks and you did that 30 times, that's still under 68 weeks, so you're fine. It's probably not a practical case, but that's how the system will behave. If you were unsuccessful for 100 weeks on one application, again, not a good example. If you were unsuccessful for 40 weeks twice, that might be a better example. Then on the second time you enter in the unsuccessful weeks, the student will also get that restriction applied to their account. Which I think I can. 94. So report a change to this application. I'm just going to put 80. Uh, helps if I finish the form. Sorry, Andrew, could you just maybe slow down a little bit? Um, sure. Thanks. Sorry. Um, yeah, well, on this one, I will go back through it again just to make sure here. So what I did is on this application here, I just um, completed that form and I said that the student failed 80 weeks of their program. Not the best example. This is just to show how it would behave. Um, if the student was unsuccessful for that time, 80 weeks is above 68 weeks. So the student now has a restriction on their account. With this restriction on their account, you can see here that they have a restriction of SSR on their account. And then obviously this page we've already flagged for content to be updated for, but you could see that. Again, on the ministry side, you can see that same thing, which let's actually just do that. On the ministry side, let's look at, I think it's the same person. They have a classic standing restriction on their account. If I were to remove this, the resolved. The restriction is now gone for the student and they can reapply. However, the counter for the amount of weeks that they have still exists. So next time the student is unsuccessful in any amount of weeks, the restriction will come back.
anything more on that one there, Elise, or anything that I should slow down on? I was going to go over the withdraw next. No, it's just that, that you're a fast typer and you move really quickly. So just if you could just uh, slow down a little bit for those of us trying to catch up, we'd really appreciate it. OK, I'll do my best. I'm just looking at the time here as well. Um, OK, so let's look at another application here. 96. So. That was the unsuccessful. Now I was going to do the withdrawal restriction. Um, this is my case here, and this application for the student is actually in enrollment, so it can't be reported to change on yet because no, it's still waiting for enrollment. Ninety-six. Oh, sorry. Just give me one second. Everyone, you can close your eyes if you don't want to pay attention to this part. Do, 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 do. Just ignore that. Any. Okay, so student completed another application. I'm now confirming the student's enrollment. Very similar before, but this time I'm going to click no. Not confirmed. So at this point, the application is here under report a change. This is a full time program. And the student withdrew from the program. Student withdrew from the program. On a specific date. And once I click submit, basically if the student has a strike on their account, so a withdraw, um, I believe it's WTHD on their account will add the actual blocking restriction. If it's not on their account, we'll add basically the first strike. For part-time, part-time is separate because this is a world where both types of restrictions and both rules have to coexist in the same system. If it's part-time, in the end, it can still go to an SSR restriction, I believe, but basically for part-time, um, it is, more or less separate. So if you're part time and you withdraw once. The, it doesn't follow the same rule as full time. So if this was a part time application and I had no strike on my account, I hit submit. I'm now basically blocked from part time funding and part time disbursements. And same thing for full time. Again, these rules are very complex and going through every single case in this call is not the most practical, so I'm just trying to give a overview of most things and then um, depending on the needs we can dive into it in other sessions or future sessions as need i could spend probably hours here which i don't think anyone wants to listen to me talk for hours so student withdrew from a program what i'm going to do though in this case is i am going to grab this student i'm going to log in as a ministry person uh, 96. 96. I'm on this person. And I'm just going to. Add a basically I just manually added a withdrawal strike to their account to basically pretend like they've already withdrawn from one of the programs. Um, in the past. This one, they are withdrawing again. From another full time application, so. Ideally, the student has a restriction on their account. And there we go. And you can see here that they have the same one. It's classic standing restriction. And if we go back to the ministry side. you'll see that they have this class extending restriction. If you remove it, same thing happens. It goes away. If you if you leave this one on it, it will come back after the next one. Um, just going to go back to my list here. So 
tuition remittance, the Scholastic Sanity UI changes, and the end application. That's sort of one topic. So tuition remittance is when I confirm the enrollment, I could enter a number or not. That number is validated against the um, requirement of how much you can actually request remittance for. Um, these UI changes is basically just the two page area where applications you can report changes on and applications you can't or you have. Um, restriction rules for disbursement. I'm not going to demo that one because it's not really possible because everything happens as per normal. But basically, if you have the restriction on your account, that is B6D, I believe, um, we won't disperse BC funding. Restriction for unsuccessful weeks. Um, that's what I was just showing you that basically if you hit 68 weeks, um, we will add the restriction on your account. If you remove the restriction and report again, it comes back. That counter basically never goes down. But you can remove it once, twice, 10 times. If the student hits 68 weeks and they would um, unsuccessfully complete again, you can remove it, they can go again. If they do it again, you can do it again. Um, it's quite flexible in that sense. The exceptions, that was the piece about a student applying for their application and then picking certain answers to questions that requires them to ask for an exception. At that point, it goes to the ministry side for them to approve the application to move forward or not. The disbursements reports is one that I did not show. This one is very straightforward and looks nearly identical to the one we showed last time. But basically in this view here, so I logged in back as a ministry user, went to the report section here and looked up the disbursements report. Um, I can't remember which data we have, so I'm just gonna pick a huge range. This is likely not a report that guys would generally look for, like seven years of all disbursements likely not something normal, but supposed to be flexible enough that you can do pretty much whatever you need. It's likely gonna be month start to month end for full-time or part-time specifically. Same thing, you then hit export, you get a CSV, you open up the CSV. If there's data in it, it will show you your nice little file here. This is the one that is much more specific where it breaks down the student SID number, the date of disbursement, and the funding type and amount, and the certificate number or document number as well. Um, if there's more sort of context needed, I don't believe that this report is not. Um, it will be it will be behind certain user roles and that type of thing when we do that in the future. Obviously, TBD. Um, this is quite a powerful report because you can look at any funding for that was basically dispersed to a student. You can also do the normal Excel stuff here so you can filter off of funding type, SINs, whatever you need to do. Um, so if for those that are not familiar with Excel, you know, you can do your standard filter and then look at, I just want to look at CSL funding, for example. Probably not one of the ones you'd look at, but there you go. Uh, so. Here we are. Here, this, this, this. Sorry, just trying to find out where my board went. There we go. Uh, tuition remittance, class exceeding, and application, disbursement reports. I think that pretty much covers it, which is good because we're at 1040 right now. Well, I just quickly read through the chat and stuff, I'm going to pass it over to Lynn to do some talk on some UI stuff that we've been doing. If you're there. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. So uh, for the UX and UI work, as you know, we continue to make accessibility updates to get us up to double A standards and in time for launch as well. So uh, this sprint focusing on the student application and NOA. So that is the notice of assessment. Um, at the same time, UX is also working alongside the devs to provide what they need and also to include baseline UX and UI. So keyword here is baseline, uh, just to keep things in scope. That we can deliver. Um, I'm actually going to also pass it off to Katrina, 
to talk about her work on the notice of assessment. She's done fantastic work to bring us up to speed with double A standards uh, for the notice of assessment. Um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Katrina, but I'll, I know that I'll be helping you drive through. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lynn, for sharing your screen here. So, yeah, what we're viewing currently is this student viewing notice of assessment. And this piece was fun to work on because we discovered some really nice opportunities to clean up sort of the general layout, reorganize information, and then, of course, make sure that everything's in line with our accessibility considerations. So. You'll notice sort of it's a bit of a long piece, but as we move through, we have these distinct um, sort of H2 headings that are all throughout the notice of assessment. So those sort of break up what we've kind of determined are the major categories of information. So if you don't mind scrolling to the top there, Lynn. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, starting off, we've just got the notice of assessment heading and then through sort of reading through the information and determining how things could be best organized, what we've done is we start things off, we have the main heading and then all the sort of subsequent associated information we've just neatly tucked into its own little card underneath. So yeah, exactly. We've got the assessment details as we scroll down for what you need to do. We've done the exact same thing. So the steps that you need to follow to get started, we've got that tucked into a card. Same thing moving down the page with your funding. And um, we've also got that tucked into a card as well. And one of the other things that um, was really nice to kind of consider here was, of course, always wanting to improve the readability of things. And then specifically in this case, even sort of the scanability. So really thinking when a student views this, what are some of the key pieces of information that they're gonna wanna sort of be able to grab um, at a glance? So if we come back to the top, we've, uh, we've been able to sort of draw those out um, yeah, sorry, if you don't mind. Perfect. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, so starting off at the top, uh, yeah, reading through the content in this section, we figured, you know what, that the amount that you're eligible for, that's pretty important. I'd want to know that if I was a student. So we highlighted that. We've differentiated that, obviously, increasing the you know size of the text, bringing it sort of bold into blue. So that's, you know, you can grab that piece of information quickly. Moving down, another one that was quite important we determined was the MSFAA number. So we've highlighted that, so that's easy to grab and then sort of incorporate into the, the steps as you move along. And then last but not least, I believe we did, yeah, the same thing with your funding dates. So another, if you just got a few seconds, you're kind of scrolling through, you can grab those pieces of information quite quickly. And yeah, another thing, if we scroll up to the top there, You'll have noticed, um, oh, <laughs> there we go, perfect. That's awesome, Lynn. Um, sort of a, a future consideration, but definitely something that we we tucked in so that it can be sort of seen in context are the two buttons. So we've got cancel application and accept assessment. And yeah, we figured that, you know, kind of nesting them right in context with sort of some of that key information um, might be, you know, helpful for the user so that, yeah, when you quickly look at it, you can find out how much you're eligible for. If that works, you've got, you can take action sort of right there in context with the information. It's, the buttons aren't hard to find. You don't have to search around for them. So again, a future consideration, but we've popped them in there just so it can be uh, kind of seen how it might operate for the time being. And I'm trying to think if we scroll down a little bit, Lynn. Thank you. Yeah, I'll touch on these quickly. Um, of course, we've also got sort of the assessment breakdown, you know, how your amount was calculated. So these are, we've got them in sort of table formats. They're also um, in the view right now, currently the tables are open. Uh, they're kind of nested in these little drop down uh, sections here. But yeah, of course, when you click on the little, what is a plus turns into a minus. Um, and then yeah, it drops down with sort of the detailed breakdown um, of, you know, assess costs and funding that you're receiving. So yeah, we've got those two tables there, but yeah, I think that's uh, those are some of the most important pieces for this guy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katrina. This is really great work that you've done. Um, you Just a note here, you won't see this on dev or test website just yet, just because we are focusing on functionality first with the dev, um, but this um, polished design will come later. So I'll leave it at that and uh, over to you, Shrinker. Awesome. Okay, I'm just going to be wrapping it up here. I'll take the screen back.
Awesome. So moving on to Sprint 31. Um, obviously, we are moving into summer vacation time for pretty much everyone. So scheduling things are a bit uh, difficult right now in terms of all sides, us internally, any business engagement type things and all that. So um, just bear with us. If there's things that are needed, they will happen. But just some scheduling things can cause some issues and everything in there. Um, so next things up on the list, um, I'm just going to gloss over some tactical stuff to do on the back end there. Um, the show part time courses on PR completion that one's so far slated. Again, this is draft right now. This is not planned as of yet. Um, we have some technical background stuff to do on some business BCID solutions there for institutions in, in particular. Um, some SIN validation management as well. That's sort of what Elise was alluding to at the beginning. Um, some view pending student applications and reassessment requests. Those are those cues we could say for the sort of the rolled up view of everything, all the exceptions that are pending, for example, all the reassessment requests that are waiting, all and so on. Um, student part time courses on PR completion. That's under student as well because that there is student application changes to accommodate that as well. And on the design side, basically status quo, continuing to do the same things that we've been doing the last um, few sprints, but more and more toward the final state. Awesome. Um, looking at feedback here, I believe things were on the mural here. I think I'm just going to pass it right over to you there, Elise. Sounds good. I'm just scrolling back to uh, to the top. There is a, a fair amount of feedback around the scholastic standing, and I think it's fair to say that today was a whirlwind of sharing information. Um, a lot of it, I think, went by really quickly. And so what I uh, what I hear from folks is, can we spend some more time looking at this? And so absolutely, uh, that's why we have our mod business check ins on the alternate weeks. So sounds like we need to do a slower uh, walkthrough of, of uh, those reporting a change. So I think if I can keep those questions for a mod business check in and we can go over that uh, starting next week um, and take however long it takes. It's not a problem. So I'm going to keep those questions for for that. Um, I think that to begin with, there was a question about MVP, and I do want to be really, really, really clear. And I think we've talked about this a few times is that MVP does not mean everything that SFAS does now is going to be in the MVP. Um, what we are trying to really focus on is what are the foundational must have pieces in the MVP and then building enhancements from there. And so that doesn't mean that everything that SPAS does is going to be there on day one. And that's a, a big change. Um, but we are working with all of the teams to make sure that if there's a piece of work that has to be done, that there's a way to do it. Um, it may be a workaround. It may be a bit awkward for a short period of time, but we do need to make sure that you can do your work. That's critical. And that's why we're doing those business process reviews to make sure that people can see their work um, and to potentially identify there will be things that are missing, I guarantee. Um, so potentially identify those as early as possible and find a solution or put forward a change request um, that's needed in order to do that work. So, so that's the process that's happening. And so we're meeting with each of the business teams um, how, for however many times it takes. And for some, it's three, four sessions and we're good to go. For others, we're working on session nine, 10, and we probably have 25 more to go to go through all of their processes. So that's something that we're doing and pulling those requirements out of there. And when I say we, that that's my team. Uh, that's doing that work and then bringing that to Andrew who then brings it to the dev team. 
Uh, there was a question about uh, we were talking or Andrew was showing off some piece about the sin or pardon me, not showing us. I was talking about the sin and the changes that were coming um, and we're looking forward to in a future stage showing you a really cool piece of functionality about yes, uploading documents uh, there looks very similar to the current process for uploading documents in the other areas of the application, but absolutely um, we know that in many cases for temporary sins, actually not many, in all cases for temporary sins, we need to validate that the information is correct and we need to confirm the um, expiry date of that sin. So we've been working with uh, Jeremy on that and so that functionality will be there. So I'm just scrolling through the chat a little bit. There's a question about how do we communicate specific information, re what we're requesting. I'm not sure what this one is about. Wade, could you maybe re-ask that and give us the context there? Sure, just, well, I mean, in the new world, there won't be letters, right? So just okay. like, you know, so so there, there are always gonna be situations where sort of, you know, a stock picked from the list response won't be enough. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around when we need something very specific that may not, you know, that we may need to actually customize a request for. How do how do we do that? And and so what it, and what the what it's relating to is, is actually going back to what I was asking about the 900 sins, because that original page on display only showed proof of citizen st status or whatever. It didn't, you know, and that was my original comment was that page also needs to uh, indicate that, you know, that that includes proof of sin being valid for the whole study period for those with temporary sins. So, you know, if, if we're not getting what we need or if or say, you know, the students, you know, um, uh, uploads, you know, their notice of decision, which is their proof of protected status, um, and we need to ask them for their uh, for their proof of sin to make sure that it's valid for the whole study period. How do we communicate that to them if we're not uploading letters? How do we have a way of actually typing out a response in some way, whether it's in system or whatever, to the student to give them instructions? Yeah, that's a good question, and that's something that will work out. My immediate response is that there's two ways to do that. So let's say the student um, indicates that they do have a temporary sin. They upload a document and the expiry um, is within the study period. And so we need to communicate to them that this is not acceptable um, because of, of that, those constraints. So we could do one of two things. We could upload a document to their account um uh, a letter this is not automated just to be really 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 clear um, this is not automated but we could upload a document which will then send a notification to the student and then they could come in take a look at the document the other option of course is that we might need to send the student a note um, through the email and just say hey here's what's going on Probably not the best best business practice, but that's something that we're we're starting to look through and make sure that we document all of that so that we've made some of those business decisions. Of course, the concern I would imagine is volume, um, but of course, remembering that there's going to be so many other things that we're not doing with so shifting our our time and that's something we'll have to look at with each team. But those are two potential solutions as to how you would communicate with a student. So just in the question. Yeah, so, oh, sorry, I was yeah, just saying, yeah, I, I didn't understand the whole, you know, the, the generalized, you know, there's not going to be letters in the new system. It, it, it wasn't landing on me that that was that we're really just referring to auto letters that we will actually still have the ability to create a letter and send it to the student if we need to. OK, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, Thank and you. you'll, you'll probably have those templates as well, right? It's just not automatically generated for MVP doesn't mean that we don't build an enhancement in the future, um, but for MVP. Jeremy, did you want to add a comment there as well? Yeah, I think we're also maybe this ties into I think for well, for those who weren't in the previous meeting, I think Nikki touched on this a little bit, but I think it ties in a little bit to the SIN verification because Wade, what we were looking at was an in progress application, but I believe what we missed there is that a the SIN validation happens on account creation, if I understand correctly. So all of this is going to be happening prior to a student already submitting their application. So the 900 SIN validation piece has to happen 
at account creation, not during the application. So that would be, I think, separating the two maybe a little bit. Because this whole process needs to happen and the mm -hmm. 900 SIN validation and the expiry date needs to happen prior to, and then trying to work out the details because I realize in saying this out loud now, we're not gonna have program information at that point. So we don't know the expiry date and you know that whole thing. So just some, some things to figure out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wade, did you have a comment? No. Okay. Jeremy, ans Jeremy answered it at the end of his thing. It's like, well, you know, how can we check to see the SINs valid for the whole study period if we don't know what the study period is yet? But Jeremy, yeah. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So these are, I mean, these are all really good questions. And we've tried to anticipate lots of things. We, the feature owners, myself, Andrew, you know, have, have we got everything? I guarantee you we haven't. I guarantee you that we're going to go, oh, God, we didn't think about that. And that's OK. So we want to try to capture that as early as we can and then figure out what to do about it. And that's those discussions. So the next comments are about the tuition remittance. And I think that um, it sounds like we need to go back and just go over that again a little bit. Um, and, and just so folks know, as much as possible, we try to show the functionality to, to, to me, to the feature owner, to, to everybody, but sometimes we miss that. And I think this is a good example where we, we haven't seen that functionality. So it's always nice to, to, as a feature owner and certainly for myself to digest that. So maybe we can, we can just go away and, and digest that a little bit. So you're seeing at the same time we are, and uh, we need to take a look at that again. So um so then there's decline okay so then we're getting into i'm conscious of the time but i think we're running into a lot of questions now about the scholastic standing which we said let's do a whole separate um separate piece for and just take some time to go over it a little bit more slowly so i'm gonna bulk those together for that conversation for a mod check-in lots of questions about how does that work? Does it create a restriction? And Andrew was showing us that, but I think we all just need to go through it a little bit more slowly and, and digest that. So we'll do that. Um, I'm just scrolling. So then um, we saw the NOA and just a reminder that the NOA, um, you know, we've contributed to that. So a lot of what you're seeing are those um, recommendations coming out of the accessibility review and uh, making that more accessible. And those are standards that uh, we have to comply with. So I'm conscious of the time and I feel like perhaps we're out of time, um, but um question about are we developing an alternative for the bceid not yet you guys are going to work on that and as soon as you have options they'll come forward to the business for us to review um so not yet see the system of if this not looking to hear so maybe if there's specific questions about something, we can take a look in the business check-in and maybe we'll just use the next couple of check-ins to say, what are your questions? Let's look over stuff. Let's make sure we haven't missed anything, except the first one, we're going to go into a deeper dive about um, report the institution reporting a scholastic standing change and what happens. And then also probably a deeper dive to look at the exceptions that you showed us today, Andrew, as well. Yeah, awesome. And just to wrap things up as well. Um, so again, feel free to use the email address there as you want to send questions. You can keep putting it in this chat if you have access to it after the meeting's over, or best option is to use the mural board um, itself, which the link is there. Um, and then we'll make sure it's addressed, and I'm sure Elise, you'll um, have your sessions and all that after. Um, things from us, as I said before, there is um, some vacations and all that coming up as well. We're gonna do our best to schedule things in advance, um, but this is coming into a bit of a scheduling nightmare time. So we'll do our best to make sure that we do what we can do. Um, there might be a bunch in a week and then nothing for a few or something like that, but we'll see at that point. Um, and then as well, at least if there's like another sort of anything you need from 
us, just let us know on some of that material and all that. Awesome. Well, appreciate it, everyone. It is 11.01, and so we will end it there. Hope everyone has a great rest of the day, and see you all in three weeks. Thanks, all. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thanks, all. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.